Without further ado, I am welcoming my father, also a legend here at Auburn University, Takiyo Spikes. How are you? I'm outstanding now that I got an opportunity to become on your podcast show. I've been waiting for a while, which is total BS, but I'm here now. Right. You you have been waiting for a while. Why have I been waiting for a while? Um, because I feel like we were just talking about God's timing and it's all in his timing. This is perfect timing. It was supposed to happen now. You are to credit for the fact that for the video podcast that I've been able to curate. You got me my cameras, my lighting, my mic. So thank you for investing in my in my future. Yeah, it's also called a future 401k for me. So when I retired, I'd be able to live off of you because you bring it in, you return the, the return on the investment, yes. the ROI. Yes, I yeah, did. that's what we're doing. Yes, but yeah. we're here today yep. to celebrate you because you were just inducted into the Tiger Trail of Auburn. And for those who don't know, it's basically like Auburn's Hollywood stars, basically, right? Right. Yeah. So they are going to submit his name right by Tumor's Corner. It's going to be there forever. How does that make you feel? Uh, it's, it's amazing. Number one, that's the first thing that really comes to mind. Uh, the second thing is I'm honored. I understand that, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not, it's a privilege. And what I mean by that is to understand and know when I first came to Auburn, you hear about the Tiger Trail, but that's so far from your mind when you're just trying to come in and become an established player. You want to come inside of school and do well. You want to make everybody proud from your hometown where you come from. And to now see it come full 360, to see my name in cement on the sidewalk forever. And always knowing somebody will always have a story to say about me. Why? Just because the name is there, put in there for legacy purposes. And the thing that I'm most proud of is you're able to see it, not just you're able to see it, but it's happening on your clock while you're here at Auburn. That is true. I mean, I was even thinking the fact that it'll be cemented there forever of the fact that this is way too soon, but like your grandkids will be able to see it. Yeah. Their kids will be able to see it. Like, I think that that's cool that it's a, literally a legacy that you're literally leaving on. So I, I'm very proud of you, but I have to call you out because out of all my time interviewing, you've always told me, listen, Jakai, dealing with these athletes, they're going to be late, prepare for them to cancel. You got to just always stick it through. So far, no athlete has ever been late. Shout out to you, Chad. Shout out to Jeff. Shout out to Dylan. Shout out to Soraya. But you are my first guest that is late for the podcast. You See, kept me waiting. What had happened was... It's called when you get older, the bladder gets smaller and you had to go use the bathroom. So I wanted to make sure I give you enough time when we actually started. So that's the reason why. Oh, so th was the bladder also the reason earlier today why you were late into the induction ceremony? Uh, next too? question. Oh, okay, 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 <laughs> okay. So on AuburnTigers.com, Look, they were bragging about you. They said that you are one of the best football players to ever put on an Auburn uniform. But also they said, coming out of high school, let's keep it honest, you were recruited by everyone. That is literally their words, including your hometown, UGA. Now you gotta tell us the story about how they reacted when you committed to Auburn University. A lot of people were mad. I grew up in a town, small rural town, Sandersville, and it's a lot of Georgia UGA alumni there. What made it even worse, Georgia had Robert Edwards. He, we grew, grew up with each other in the, in the same high school. So people were mad. Even to this day, people still come up to me and say, you know what, Spikes, you all right. 
But you could have did one thing right in your life. And if you would have went to Georgia, you and I would have been best friends. And my response to them is, well, you know what? At least I got it the majority of it right. Because at the end of the day, if you look at what I've been able to accomplish, even by not going to Georgia, I still think it's pretty good. But like it's it's it was one of those things. And 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 keep in mind, recruiting now or recruiting back then wasn't nowhere near as it is now. It still was crazy back then, but now you got NIL and all of this stuff comes into fold. But what I went through back then, a lot of people were upset, especially in the hometown state. Even some people in the city that I grew up in, you know, and like I get it. I never took it personal for me because at the end of the day, like I got to service me, you know, so and all that other stuff can wait. I, I, don't, I, I really don't care about that. Tell me about the story when you were coming out of the tunnel and when your mom was going back and forth with some of the Georgia fans? Oh, uh, so my mama, you, so my, <laughs> so my mama, she can talk bad to me, but she won't let nobody else talk bad about me, especially to her. So we playing in the game or actually before the game and I look up and I see, you know, just like, I saw my father, I saw like my friends, like Q, everybody, they there. And you could just tell something had happened. And I'm like, what's going on? And so after the game, I, did, I, I found out that she didn't like what somebody was saying about me because they were mad because I decided to go to Auburn. So she was like, all right, so if you want to make this personal, we don't make it personal. So she dropped all the F-bombs and threaten them and she was like you ain't gonna talk about my baby boy like that so I've always knew she was always gonna stand up for us but at that point in time they knew that she was gonna stand up not only for me but for all of her kids but in particular me at that time just because like we were playing Georgia you talk about your mother standing up for you. And I relate because throughout my life, you're always standing up for me. Even in the hardest times before I entered into college, taking my SAT, taking my ACT, I know that you had a little trouble with that and it was blasted on newspapers yeah. when you were trying to take it in order to get to college. So tell us about that story for you and how did you handle the negativity that was coming your way because you were still so young. Yeah, it was, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of kids need to hear, you know, this story, you know, what we're talking about now because standardized tests is really not a true, um, it's not the epitome of who you are and what you know from an acumen side as far as knowledge. A lot of those tests are, are, you know, really based upon just where you come from. And the problem I had, I was a very good student, had over 3.0 GPA, really close to 3.5 in high school. But when it came to taking standardized tests, I would just freeze up. And for whatever reason, it, it was just the pressure got to me. I never knew it was called anxiety at the time, but that's what what happened when I got ready to take the test and then I would just bomb on it. And so it took me some time all the way through my senior year to actually uh, make my score and, and, and pass it. But uh, one of the things that I take from it was I never allow anybody else's opinion of me to become my reality. And what I mean by that is you got to keep in, keep in mind Throughout that time, I was grew up in Sandersville, small double-A school. I got the Atlanta Journal-Constitution writing about me. Every week it's an update report. And I'm not even from the city of Atlanta. I got the Macon, Augusta, all the way down south to Albany. USA Today is writing, reporting about 
well, he's great. He's done this. He's accomplished that. But he still hasn't passed his test score. And so it was, I've always told you, the person who carries the pen carries the narrative. And from that point, that was the first time my mother really taught me. She was like, this is some BS right here. They never should even put that in there and highlight it the way that they do. But it's okay. This too shall pass and you will overcome. So for me, I continued to stay steadfast in what I believe in. It was times I used to, I still signed with Auburn. This was the good thing. All the teams still took a risk. They was like, well, he's going to pass it. We're not even worried about it. He's going to pass it. So I signed with Auburn. And I used to go drive three and a half hours every weekend to take prep classes to take the test. And that's how I eventually passed it. But for me, I think what's important for everybody to know is, is like, that's just a small representation of who you are and what you have to go through in order for you to attain what's really set out for you. And I didn't let it define me. And the, and the thing that I remember most about the struggle that I had with the test, my mother it was an educator. She was at the same high school I was at, the only high school in the town. And I remember one day I was just like, man, I, I hope this damn test come back. I'm trying to pass this damn test. And I just forgot about it. And I'm walking out of class, walking out of the weight room, and I just see my mama. She, I had never seen her run. She running, yelling with a paper in her hand. I'm like, man, what's wrong with my mama? She yelling loud, get up. You made, you passed and you made it, you made it. And so from that, it really just reminded me like, man, you really can do whatever you want to do. You just got to make that commitment and that sacrifice of just honing in on your skill, regardless of what everybody else is saying and what they're thinking. Block it out and just continue to move at your at your race. I mean, there were for sure times when you talk about continuing on your race where you literally told me, put on the blinders, just focus on yourself. I appreciate you for believing in me, even when sometimes I don't even believe in myself and my own potential. Now, when we are talking about education, you did mention in your induction speech that education has always just been important to you and to your parents. So how did they react when you said that, okay, I'm declaring for the draft, and like when you had to basically leave school early? They, education was always at a high premium in the, high, in the household, but I think they knew at that time, like, from what I was able to do, winning MVP of the SEC championship game, going up against Peyton Manning, Tennessee Volunteers, and then finishing that game, going into the bowl game against Clemson, they saw that I was just making standout plays. And I talked to them, and they always told me, they always said, we're going to let it be your decision, but we won't let you make a bad decision. And so at that point in time, I knew I had the keys to the car and I just felt like it was time for me to go ahead and take my talents to the next level. And um, that was really the deciding factor. And, and once I told them about it, they didn't have any problems with it. They understood because they knew like, man, they did the research on themselves and they saw that my son really got a chance to be, in a, be a first round pick in the NFL. So I continue to have this, their support. Um, you know, my mama always loved it just because she's the only person who I know who watched football for over 20 years and still don't understand the game. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember I used to get so frustrated with her. I used to be like, Ma, just look at me. Just look at me. You you look at me, you'll know what's going on. But that's when I was in high school, and I used to catch, I caught a lot of touchdown passes. And fortunate enough for me, on the defensive side, I was always around the ball. So she had a, that was a really her first introduction. So she was okay with it because she knew we were going to be okay. She knew, like, financially, 
even though it was this was my my race, she knew as a family we would be okay. So you mentioned your mom multiple times. Mm -hmm. Although, what role did your father, Jimmy Lee Spikes, have in your life at that time before he passed away? He, my father had a big role in my life. He was the first person who introduced me to the game of football. He was the, the person who took me to practice day in and day out. He was the person that would remind me, if you want to get better at it, it ain't going to happen with you playing Sega Genesis. Now, back then, we had Sega Genesis. That's what I want to say it probably was the first video gaming system out, maybe before Nintendo. Now you got PlayStation 10, 12, whatever you want to call it. But he meant a lot to me, and he was all, he was my support and everything. So um, his role, what he played, my father was wise. As I mentioned in my speech earlier, um, he didn't finish school. Um, he had to quit, quit school at the age of six, seven, six, seven grade not the age, but in that great range at that time because, you know, they, they stayed in a house to where they had to farm the fields. He was a sharecropper. And in order for them to stay in the house, that's what he had to do, him and his brother. So none of them actually finished school. And so his importance or his why he is so important to me is because he always wanted us as his kids to have something what he didn't have. And that was an opportunity to do a lot of things. And that's the reason why he allowed me to play so many things, so many sports. And then, but also when it came time for school, he would always say, you ain't playing it, not one damn sport. If you come in here and you bring bad grades into this house. And I believe him. And so from that point, it was always, that was his way of drawing the line in the sand. And that was my way of saying, I see where you're drawing that line, and I never want to teeter across that line. A, a, some of his parenting styles that you bring up, I see how you have incorporated that with me. But then also how he was a leader in your life. I mean, 13 out of the 15 seasons that you played in the NFL, you were team captain. Yeah. Like, that is a huge deal when when people ask like what are you so proud about about your dad's like football career I would say that because you're such a great leader what leadership styles did your father teach you the first thing is never ask anybody to do something that you're not willing to do that's the only way you're going to get their respect meaning you got to show that you're part of the people if you want to lead the people, you got to show that you're a part of the people where you can resonate with the people. And how do you do that? You get out, you put your boots on, and you take one step at a time the same way the next man or the next woman would do it. And for me, I didn't realize that the stat that you read off, 13 out of my 15 NFL years, I was voted team captain. That's a special, special thing to your point because that didn't dawn upon me until I retired from the game. And I thought, I played on five different teams. So it's not like, you know, you see some politicians and they got the comfort seat. They do just enough to fool the people, but they know they got the backing of everybody to kind of still keep them elected. When you move around to different teams, it ain't no such thing as a locker room lawyer. Like, Guys are going to call you out. They see BS, they're going to call BS out. You can talk all you want to, but if you ain't putting in the work, they're not going to follow you. So for me to be able to do that, you know, five years in Cincinnati, we're technically four, because my second year, that's when I was nominated captain. When I got to Buffalo, I was nominated captain. When I got to Philly, uh, I was nominated captain there. Then when I went to San Francisco, I got there late. I wasn't nominated captain the first year, but the next two years I was. Then I finished my last two years in San Diego around a bunch of some more strangers, guys who didn't know Takeo. So for me, it was about more so 
what I do on a daily basis and how I carry and conduct myself. And I wasn't willing to ask you to do something that I wasn't willing to do. And I, and my, my, my leadership style was more so of in today's time, you get a lot of clickbait. People always say stuff so they can get caught around and that's fine. But for me, I always felt like I could get the individual to respond by saying, Hey, Jakai, look, this is what I'm saying. I don't think you're doing this. It ain't nobody else's business. I need for you to step your game up. And people always responded to that because they appreciate when you come straight to the source versus you being the source, you give it out to a bunch of other people who ain't got nothing to do with it. Now they coming back telling you what I said and now it's misconstrued. So I think that has a lot to do with just the leadership style. You mentioned going from Philadelphia to Buffalo to San Francisco to all, all these different teams. Yeah. But in the midst of while you're playing in the league, your father passed away. How were you able to pick yourself up and keep going? It was extremely hard. He passed away my fourth year in the league. Then you were born the fifth year. But my father, he, I mean, he was everything to me. He meant a lot to me. He was instrumental in my growth physically as well as just mentally just pushing me on that side and just making sure every day when I woke up, I, I walked with a purpose. And when he passed away, that hurt me. I remember when he was diagnosed, I was getting ready to go to the NBA All-Star game. And I remember my mother calling me and she was like, you need to come home. And I was like, she said, your dad is sick. I didn't even ask what's wrong. I just hung up the phone, started crying, because I knew this is the man who I've never seen have a cold, a common cold. Like he was tougher than woodpecker lips now. This dude here was like beef jerky tough. And, you know, when they told me he had the glioblast tumor, tumor in, on his brain, and uh, to hear the doctors just say, you know, this is one of the worst ones. Most people live six months to a year, you know, but we, we got him, we got your father looking at maybe six to 10 months. And I was like, no, we ain't gonna believe that. We ain't claiming that. So, uh, but when he passed away, before he passed away, it was in the summertime. He passed in October. It was the summertime and I had to go to training camp. I did not want to go to training camp because I knew like I knew I, kn I knew that was gonna be the last time that I saw him and I didn't, I didn't go. And I went to camp maybe like five days, maybe like five days late. And I remember coaches calling me. One of my coaches called me and he was like, hey, Takeo, you know, like we need you. Soon as he said that I, I cussed his ass out immediately. Don't you ever call me, I'm down here dealing with my daddy. Only reason why I went to training camp was because my mother and my sister, they said, he gonna be all right. We gonna make sure he good. And that meant the world to me because I knew once I left, People look at sport and they see, oh, you get the money, you get the fame, you get to do whatever you want to do. But you don't realize I put my pants on the same way that you do. People tell athletes, shut up, you know, you know, shut up and just play ball. How dare you say that? Like we're human too. And so for me, that was part of the human aspect that I wasn't willing to let go. Just be, I didn't give a damn how much money you was paying me. Like, that's my daddy. So I was able to leave 
I used to come back home on off days. We have Tuesday off on Sunday after the game. That Monday, I just fly home, see him, and fly back on Tuesday night. But he passed away in October. But I, I have no regrets about the way that I handle it just because, you know, your family is your tribe, and you need a good family to have a support cast around you to help you get places. And, like, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Like, family is everything for me. For sure. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so when you were doing your induction speech, there were emotions that came up, a lot of emotions. What would you say is so special about these ceremonies? The special thing about the ceremonies are seeing some of the people that grew up with me. I'm 18. I got here at like 17, 18 years old, and I see some of the same people still on that journey with me. I see some of the same contributors who don't get the credit that they truly deserve, but I know how important they are to me. So that's why I took time out to acknowledge them. That's why I was so emotional. And then the other part of it was like, like you just, as much as you think you have a plan for life, like God has, God got you, man. Like he, he got you, he got you. I never would have known you would be here at school. We doing a podcast together. You're getting, re getting ready to graduate, but you're also at my ceremony. And to be able to see that and allow other people who poured into me, now they're pouring into you, like, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate, like, carrier of, like, the responsibility of what it means to be an Auburn man or an Auburn woman. If you guys haven't checked out the video teaser that they actually posted in honor of you getting inducted today on Auburn Football's Instagram and Twitter, make sure that you guys check that out. That leads me into my next question. I love seeing like those throwback videos of you playing. I just love them. I love hearing you speak. That's what I love about you. In that clip, you said, guys, let's play smart. When a lot of us are watching football, we're like, they're not playing smart at all. They're just running into each other. So why is it important for an athlete to play smart? I mean, you, you, it's two things in life. I think whenever you wake up, your, your feet hit the ground. You have to be strategic about everything that you do. And you have to be all out, all out on it, like 100% in. So, um... For me, playing on the field, everybody is blessed with a certain athletic ability or a certain proudness that they have. But the, the biggest thing is, is understanding how can I take it to the next level? It's something simple. It's third and two. There's no way this ball, this offense has the ball on their 30-yard line. Not ours, but theirs. Third and two. They're going to come out and try to third and two. If they make you jump outside, that's five yards. That's the first down. Like, so in the huddle before third down, it's third. Anytime it's third down and five or less, I'm telling people, play smart. They're going to give you hard count. That way they don't have to run the ball. They don't have to throw it. They're going to make you jump offside. And I think you have to have that type of mentality and understand, don't just come out here and just react. The game is hard enough as it is. Once you start thinking about the game big picture and you understand the little nuances of it and you can take your athletic ability that you've been blessed with and now take your football acumen that you have and combine it all together, like that's art. It ain't football no more for me. So, And I think the ones who do it, the ones that who we fall in love with, whether or not if it's the quarterback position, wide receiver, those are the ones who truly understand it. It's the little things in the game that they do and apply what 
separates their greatness to a higher level. It's the difference from waking up in the morning being average, which everybody is. It's the difference from being average to good, putting in a putting in some work. And it's also the difference from being good to great. It's the it's the ultimate separator. Why in that Auburn video clip did you say, I'm just a boy from Georgia. I'm not even supposed to be here. Like, what made you think that? That was actually pulled from another clip. But who would have ever thought a kid coming out of Sandersville, Georgia, population maybe in Washington County population, maybe 20,000. So when you look at that, you might want to fact check that. I know you're good at that. But population is small. But when you look at that and you look at my resume of all of the things that, I, things that I've done, places I've been, rooms that I've sat at the table with other leaders, that's not supposed to be me. That's supposed to be somebody who was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Somebody who was had opportunities before without even asking for opportunities. It wasn't supposed to be me. But what I don't want to get lost in translation is it can be you. It can be you if you stay committed to your faith. It can be you if you focus in and write down your goals. It can be you if you sacrifice and versus you doing what everybody else is doing. How about just truly just stay in focus and say, you know what? Let me just try something different and see if I get a different result. And if I get a different result and it happens to be good, why not try it again and let's see, can I take it to another level? Every day when I wake up to this day, 47 years old. This is what I hear. That's footsteps of somebody coming behind me trying to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish in my personal goals. And I hear that. That makes me get up. I don't stay in the bed late. You know that. Mm -hmm. I get up and I'm focused on what I'm trying to do. So for me, that's the big picture for me. It's like, how can I continue to leave a legacy behind, not only for you to see, for your kids' kids to be able to see and set an example and also inspire people from within to know you really could be whatever you want to be. You just got to believe it. When you talk about believing it, how you can be whatever you want to be, but also I have a question. How did your work ethic separate you from the majority? My work ethic separated me. All right. Everybody's going to get up and do what's on the, on the agenda. That's why it's called an agenda. Are you really going to get better than anybody else? Nah. If you blast, you'll be a little bit better. But how it separated me, I used to write down goals. And for me, it was like, okay, if I really want to take this to the next level, I can't do what everybody else is doing and say, oh, I'm going to be a top round pick. I got to be able to put in more work than they do in order for me to be that much better when it's displayed in private, public. And I've always had a saying, what you do in private will be displayed in public. In every facet, it will be displayed. And so for me, it was like, how can I get over? If me and you competing for a position or competing to make a play, how can I make this play before you? Well, I know when you get off work, you're going to go home and turn on TV and probably look at something that's not going to be contributing to what you, what you need to be doing in order to get there. So what I would do was find those little 15, 30 minutes out of the day. And that would be my, I call it my cheat time. It may not seem like much, 30 minutes a day, 
But if I do it for seven days a week and you add those 30 minutes up, now I'm hours ahead of you. Now, if I add that up and make that into months, now I'm days ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's always been my method. Be very strategic about how you operate and do it at 100%. I like that. In 1997, you already mentioned this, but the SEC championships going against Peyton Manning and the volunteers, and then also you winning MVP of the game. How was it to compete against Peyton Manning? And have you guys curated a relationship outside of the game? Uh, that was a huge, huge game. And for me, Peyton was, I mean, Peyton was the golden boy. You know, like you look at his pedigree, what he come from, and his father, Archie, he had his older brother. He wasn't fortunate enough to play, so, but, but Peyton was the guy, and he was as good as advertised, too. So I knew playing against Peyton Manning, everybody's going to be watching and hoping he has success, but who is going to be that dude to stop him? And that's what I looked at myself as. I got to stop him on every play. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to walk away from that game, even though we lost MVP of the the Peach Bowl game. Not the Peach Bowl, but the uh, SEC championship game. Had a great game, but from that, from that game, we always knew of each other from playing in the SEC with each other. But I, I gained respect from Peyton Manning because everywhere he looked, I was there. I had like 14 tackles, two forced fumbles, both of them taken back for a touchdown. You know, so quarterback hit on Peyton. So for me, I gained the respect from him because as much as he's the ultimate competitor, that's who I was too. And I wanted to make sure I was trying to rain on his parade, to be quite honest. I, like, man, I hear you talking about Peyton, but you don't know about Takeo today now. That was my thought process. How would you have taken advantage of the NILs if you had an opportunity to get it while you were in college? If oh. it's still like, if it even existed while you were in college? Well, it existed, not at this fine uni university right here, but other people gave them dirty handshakes. But we ain't gonna get into that. But I would have ate it up. I, I listen. I'm a media like my. I'm, I got a big personality anyway, mm -hmm. and I felt like if if we would have had nil back then, any commercials, I'm your guy. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Rain Yellowwood. I would have been happy to do cut a commercial with Mr. Rain. Absolutely. Chopping wood. Building a house, whatever it's on tape, sign me up. What a check it. I was gonna get it. Um, so <laughs> in the War Eagle Plus interview that's coming out, you say how Auburn, how you're an Auburn man. Yeah. What about Auburn instilled in you the qualities? of how to be a man? I don't think it's, I don't think it's so much Auburn. Mm. You know, the qualities of a man of what's inside of me, my ethos, what I live by daily, that was installed in me from my parents, my father, you know, the business side from my mama. I, I still hear my mama in my head today. Boy, get some business about yourself, don't be late you know, things of that nature. So, <laughs> like, they really put the qualities in me. But when you, are all, when you are an Auburn man slash Auburn woman, those are the qualities that true Auburn people have. I can be all the way in California, which I was a few weeks ago. Somebody looked at me and said, War Eagle. War Eagle. Another person over here who went to USC, Southern California, he was like, 
What does that mean? Don't worry about it, buddy, because you should have went to Auburn if you really wanted to know. It means a lot of love. And that's what I talk about meaning being an Auburn man or an Auburn woman. I like that coming from an Auburn woman. Yeah. Um, so in all your time in the league, 15 years in the league, what was your favorite team to play for and why? I, I can't, that's not really a, a clear cut answer. I will say this, the, the best place to where I played to play football, I would say probably Buffalo because it reminded me of Friday night football in Georgia. And the best place to play football and enjoy the city would probably be San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You had the diversity. Um, Cali is just on a, it's, it's, it's the history that comes along with the 49ers. So it was uh, the way that they ran the organization. Um, and then just me being introduced to like food you know, like dinner restaurants and different food aspects from different cuisines, um, like Indian food. You look at like Mexican, you look at, uh, yeah, what else? I mean, you grew up on barbecue and all of that, but like all of that is encompassing of what made San Francisco so good. Is that where your palate kind of started to grow? Because, I mean, no offense, but you're from Sandersville, Georgia. So, like, and you eat so many different stuff now. So, I'm like, where did you get that from? That was a nice backhanded slap, what you just gave me just then. <laughs> I <didn't eat> you. <laughs> no, I just, I just, when you get tired, listen, when you get tired of eating the same, same stuff all the time, like, like, it's only so many chicken fingers you can eat. That's a shout out to two time Ray Ed. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, man, everybody like you cook them, they they cook one way. So for me, I just wanted to try something different. I grew up eating a whole lot of stuff. Grew up eating raccoon. We used to shoot robins, take them to my grandma and she cooked them. Turtle. The only thing, only thing I never, no, I never ate any uh, possum. I, don't, I never did that. But, like, we lived off the land. And I need to get you back on it anyway, because that might get your immune system up. Get back, I was never on, y'all. I was never, well, no, I did have chitlins. Yeah, you did. Yeah. I used to put it in your milk when you was a baby. You ain't know it. Ew, uh, that's not <laughs> it at all. Um... So, ending this lovely interview. Okay. What is a memory that you will cherish forever here at Auburn? I would, the memory, one memory that I would cherish forever. It's going to change, but for right now, coming back to finish what I started, when I came to graduate and I brought my mother, my sister, you, Jalen, Auntie Sonia, all my family coming back and we took a picture. That was in 2017. And to see you now, eight years later, you're about to graduate. So when I see that picture of all of us together, it just, it reminds me of like, it reminds me of life. And what I mean by that is, as much as you think you have things figured out and this is the path that you want your kids to go, like, you ain't got nothing figured out. The only thing that it reminds me of, or what it reminds me of daily, 
You do the right thing. Stay prayed up. Show your kids the right way. And hopefully everything will work itself out in the end. And so now to fast forward, maybe what, eight years later now is that's what I'm more so I'm proud of looking at that image of what we took back in 2017. I'm very proud of that because I didn't have to come back and finish school. You you didn't have to. And you also didn't have to then pursue your MBA at University of My in Miami. So why was that important for you? Well, I, I would like to say I got sucked into getting into getting an MBA. I know that sounds crazy, but so when I was thinking about going back to school, I was like, uh, I don't know if I'm ready to go back. Then I had two of my partners, Carlos Emmons and also uh, Tuton Reyes. They was talking about, man, we going to get an MBA. And I didn't say anything because I'm sitting in the cut thinking, damn, you can't even think about an MBA. You ain't even got an undergrad degree. So I kept hearing them talk, and I remember Carlos saying, man, you can sit on boards. You can be on advisory boards. You can get paid. People always come to you, and you, you see a bigger perspective. And I was like, there's no way in hell I'm about to let them get an MBA without me getting one. So guess what I did? I said, let me go ahead and call up Auburn and tell them I'm coming back home and I need to finish ASAP so I can start this program before my boys did. And I did it. And that was like, that was really like the whole impetus of like me just going forward and just finishing what I started. What's the funniest story or moment you remember from being in school with your one of two of your best friends at the University of Miami. All right, so I got one. This one is <laughs> this one time we were Rihanna came out with this song. What was it? Work. What was the title of it? It was work. It was work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's because we talked about this. And we decided to take a, uh, it wasn't a skip day. It was like a day that we really needed just to like decompress. We went to the beach. We had a couple cold adult beverages. And Tuton was liking the song so much, he was over there some, like, work, 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 work. And we were like, two, you got to chill, son. You got to chill. He felt like he was in mode, like he was Rihanna. Uh, that was a good, funny time. But then I think the other time was we we all like stay up. We all talk to each other. We can talk to each other. This particular night, I was like, I knew it was gonna be a long night. I don't like staying up late doing homework. Like it just that ain't never been me. If I gotta stay up late and do it, it probably ain't gonna get done. We had a group assignment. My boys, they were taking their time trying to get it done, everything. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to do my part. And it was part of a paper. And I remember writing my stuff down. I had my whole stuff, wrote it. And I got ready to go to them. And this is like, like 1.30 in the morning. And they haven't even gotten started. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to stay up all night. I remember I got my paper, gave it to him. I said, look, y'all can have at it. You can do whatever you want to do. We get what we get. But I'm not staying up all night. Here go mine. I'll let y'all tomorrow morning. And I remember them like, damn. Why he got to be so damn loud like this all the time and rude? I was like, man, you know I don't be staying up late. I ain't staying up late doing no homework. I just can't stay up late. I just get sleepy when I start looking at stuff like that. Now, nah, if it's Instagram, there's something. No, nah, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, what's your advice for me as I am about to end college, graduating in August 2024? We're both in the same. Well, you're way further advanced in the media business than I am. You're where I 
aspire to be. So what advice do you have for me? My advice for you moving forward to my sweet daughter is understand your race is your race. Don't be concerned with what everybody is doing. And it's very entertaining to pick up the phone and look at Twitter, look at Instagram, and see, oh, they got this job? They hired him? Who he knows? Who she knows? Your race is your race. All you need to, to do is to continue to be strategic in all facets of your craft and you work your butt off consistently. And I always tell you, and I've always told you, when you know you got it right and when you're doing it right is when your parents and people who are close to you who typically talk to you from time to time, they're going to be, what's wrong with you? We don't hear from you no more. And, it, and, it, and it's not that you don't have time for them anymore. You working on the master plan. Mm -hmm. And right now, this is what you got to do. And you're going to lose some people on the way to the top. It gets lonely. But always know the people who will understand know the bigger vision that you have. So run your race and don't worry about nobody else. Why? One of my favorite sayings. I'm anointed. You are anointed. You got favor. People can't compete with favor. I don't care what you got on your side. When you got favor, they can't compete with it. You got the talent. You got the skill set. And you got the drive. So I just challenge you to stay focused. And as my boy always say, Edger and James, if you do that, you will create the life that you want to live. I like that. I received that. And it's not my first time hearing that advice from you. Yeah. So he just doesn't do it for just for the cameras, guys. But today is a day we're actually about to go. Can you tell me something that you're looking forward to? Just looking forward to seeing about, you know, you read all of these articles. You know, he who carries the pen carries the narrative. I need to see if, if some of these ballers out here are what they are advertised to be. A lot of new transfers coming in, a lot of new high school students coming in for the first time participating. So I want to see from the linebackers, see what they do. I want to see the quarterback position, Peyton. I want to see has he gotten better from last year and what leadership, state, what leadership steps that he's taking in order to be that guy. All right. Awesome. Well, we will definitely see that today. How did you feel when it was your first day day? Uh, you don't know what to expect. But for me, it was like, I'm just going to hit everything that moves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you do that, you're going to have a positive grade on your, on your report when you come back in and watch film. So for the ones who don't know what's going on, you see ball, get ball. You'll figure everything else out after that. When we talk about hit everything that moves, the next interview that we have is going to be life after football to see how that took a toll on. Oh, yeah, I'm going through it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's part two, and we'll get that yeah, back that, to Yeah, that's part two. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.